right, Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. It says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Hay, Ahe, Allah. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before, before it or after it, and the Lord, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all that are here today. We are thankful primarily that you are here today. We ask for your blessings upon us. We ask that you would guide and, and direct us, open our, our minds and, and our ears, that we might hear, that we might understand the things that you are teaching us today. Uh, forgive me of my sins and enable me to accomplish this task that is before me at this time. We ask that you would uh, save any that would hear this, hear your word today that are lost. We ask that you would draw your people closer to you, that we would uh, just seek a closer walk with you today. We ask that those that are, could not be here uh, due to illness, that your hands would be upon them as well. Uh, all these things we ask in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I think Sister Pi might have had an inkling of what I would be preaching today. She posted that cartoon. Uh, it says, The sermon that uh, left me with a sense of wonder. I wonder what on earth... He was trying to say that you may come away with that uh, today as we are we're uh, attempting to preach. But I was thinking uh, on what should I preach? You know, it, it's a constant struggle for those of us who preach uh, regularly. What are we going to preach? There are some guys that preach every once in a while and they've got maybe three sermons and they just preach those over and over again wherever they go. Uh, but there's constantly, what would the Lord have me to preach? And you're trying to be topical sometimes, trying to, to, to address a need. And I was thinking about the time change. Uh, and I thought the, the first thing I thought was preach out of Isaiah where God set the, 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 the sundial back 10 degrees. Uh, I believe that was, uh, if my calculations are correct, that was probably about 2.4 uh, hours, about two and a half hours that, that he set the sundial back. Um, but then we have this account here in Joshua where God made the sun stand still. You know, we're so caught up about time. You say, well, you're, you're never caught up about time. You're always late. Uh, but at the same time, we run our lives by time. The reason why we have this time change is because, you know, we have daylight savings time. We have, we, sometimes we want it to... To, to stay, get light earlier. Sometimes we want it to stay light later. And uh, I wish they'd quit messing with it. Uh, I like this particular time, but there are some people that feel the opposite. Uh, I just wish that God would save those people and they would see the light. Then they would understand that it is good to have light further into the day than it is to uh, uh, have light uh, way early in the morning. But... All this thought of time. You know, God works outside of time anyway. He is eternal. And many times, many times that, that we do not understand, and especially the critics don't understand, and we're going to look into some of the things that the critics actually say about this passage, Lord willing. They don't understand that God is not held by nature's laws. God is the one that makes the nature. God is control of na in control of nature. And they think that this is an impossible event. Well, yes, with man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God had a purpose for doing what he did. And when God has a purpose for doing what, what he does, 
that purpose will be fulfilled. Doesn't matter how foolish men think that we can control things or, 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 or change things or affect things. All things are in God's hands. Now, saying that, we look first at the prayer of Joshua. Understand that Joshua is not the one that, that held the sun in, in, in its spot and held the moon in its spot. Joshua spoke to the Lord. Verse 12. It says, And Joshua spake unto the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of God. He made his, his request to God. And he asked for the sun to stand still and for the moon to stand still as well. Verse 14 says, The Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Now we're going to understand a couple of things that, that, that it was all dependent on God, that he made his request made to God, and God listened to what he had to say. Now it also points out that this was as something, that this event was something that had never happened before, never happened again. And, uh, we don't always get the things that we pray for, and we will look into that. But understand this, this was Joshua that made this request. Now the people, and to this very day, when you ask a Jewish person, who is the significant person in their history, they will point to Moses. They will point to Moses. It wasn't Moses that made this request. It wasn't Elijah that made this request. And James said Elijah was a man just like us. He had fears and he had doubts and, 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 and he had flaws just like us. But he prayed fervently and it didn't rain. And he prayed again and it did rain. It wasn't Elisha. These were great men of God and God used them for miracles. Now, I will point out once again, when I was talking about miracles, God still performs miracles today. But he doesn't do it in the way that he did back in biblical times, as far as calling out a man, a man or men. And once again, we, we know that, that there was a sp specific time when Aaron and Moses and Joshua were able to perform these great miracles under God's power and, and, and God's will. And then for a long time, there are no miracles. And then Elijah and Elisha come onto the scene. And once again, great miracles are being performed. And people looked at Elijah and they were like, look at them, what a great man of God. He pulls fire out of heaven and Elisha comes along and he does greater things than Elijah. Then no miracles at all throughout the rest of the Old Testament. There were great men of God. There were prophets of God throughout the Old Testament, but we don't see a time of miracles until the time of Christ and his apostles. So those that are claiming that they're performing these great miracles are charlatans today. God used these men for specific times. Will there be a time of great miracles again? Yes, there will be. After the rapture, there will be two witnesses that come upon the earth. They will once again perform miracles for a short period of time. But the prayer of Joshua, well, cry, he cried out to God. He wasn't uh, uh, the one that everybody, you know, still I believe probably the nation of Israel had grown up under Moses and they, they, they thought that Moses was the, the greatest man ever to live. It is the, and the point I'm trying to make, it is not the man. It is the man that God uses. Amen. This was God's man praying for God's will. You can walk out right now and, and, and cry out to the sun as much as you want to. God had a purpose for doing what he did. Well, we'll look into that.
Now, in preparing for this, I was uh, looking for information. One thing I like to do is, is look up sermons that other men have, have preached on these passages. And neither one of these passages uh, uh, have a whole lot uh, compared to some others uh, that, that people have commented. They, they try to shy away from some of these passages, it seems like. Uh, I don't know Brother Lonnie Bennett. Lonnie Bennett is a Baptist preacher. He, he runs in the same circles that, that we do. Uh, he's, uh, I've never met the man. I know of him. Uh, uh, but I found a sermon that he had preached at Bryan Station Conference at some point. And he preached on this passage, and the title was, Do You Want God to Answer All Your Prayers? And when you hear that title, you think, well, that sounds charismatic. That sounds charismatic, you know. That sounds name it and claim it. Well, and most of these guys will preach something like that. And it's basically, I'm going to give you a formula for God to answer all your prayers. But if you listen to the sermon, the point he is making is you don't want God to answer all your prayers. Because you pray some foolish prayers sometimes. And he pointed out Elijah, how Elijah asked for God to kill him. You don't want God to answer all your prayers. You just want to turn it over to God and trust him with your concerns. What miserable shape we would be in if God answered all our prayers. And if we turn it over to God, you'll be surprised how God works things out. My uh, wife's aunt prayed that I would get a good Christian woman. She prayed that Sister Pie would get, I won't say good, but a Christian man. <laughs> now we lived hours apart. God took that prayer. She didn't pray for a specific person for either one of us. She told us years later, I never thought as I was praying for you all that you two would end up together. Um, Brother Jeff Brown, I was watching him uh, as he preached at Winton Place a few weeks ago. He talked about a young couple. Now one was a, a, a woman that he, he used to be the youth minister at Winton Place before he went out to pastor in Indiana. And he said, I prayed for this man, this, this young man, that he would get a, a good woman. I prayed for her that she would find a godly man. God put them together. God will do the miraculous, not because we have a great idea. But the point is, sometimes we pray for things that are not in our best interest. So the answer, do you want God to answer all your prayers? Not necessarily the way you want him to answer it. But this was not an idle prayer. And a lot of times we have idle prayers as well. Things that are, that, that are foolish and things that, that, that are flippant. The, the, the prayer of Jabez people, they are very flippant in what they want. A lot of the charismatic people are, are very, uh, uh, they pray for silly things. Now, I don't know if this, is, if this is really ties into a whole lot, but I wanted to touch on this today because this seems to be a philosophy that is prevalent in this area. They will take Proverbs 18.21. Let's just look at that real quick. And the point I'm going to make is they misapply this proverb. So I don't want to misquote it. I want to go, I want to read it correctly. What did I say, 1821? Anybody out there listening? Thank you, sister. 1821. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The they that love it shall eat 
the fruit thereof. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. I said I didn't want to misquote it. I can't even read it right. And they will take that, and somebody somewhere here in the last 150 years or so, and probably much less than that, has turned that proverb to saying that you can control anything in the world with your tongue. They will say that you can speak something into existence. I know one person that can speak something to an existence. Amen. And it's God Almighty. They say you can make yourself sick, you can make yourself healthy, you can make yourself wealthy, you can change any situation by the power of your tongue. Where do you see that in that verse? One verse out of the Proverbs. Now, a proverb is a principle to live by. Okay? It is not a doctrine. This is a, is something that you should live by. And all this is saying, if you look at it in the proper context, is that you can hurt or you can help with your words. That's all it's saying. You can injure someone. You can help the situation. And your, your tongue, as James said, is a powerful member. It's not saying that we can perform witchcraft by saying something and making it be. 2 Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, you just can't take a scripture and say, well, this means this to me and, and make it mean that. That's what they have done with that particular verse. How do I know that? Because nobody preached that up until the early 1900s. Nobody taught that until the 20th century. And the charismatics come along and they have changed what Christians have understood about Scripture and turned it around into, into something else. Joshua did not name it and claim it. Joshua spoke unto the Lord and the Lord heard him. The Lord respected his prayer because he knew why he prayed it. God had a purpose in answering that prayer. And it was answered not because Joshua was any better or any worse than anybody else. He was God's man. He had God's power. And he prayed for God's purposes. Prayer is our aligning ourselves to the will of God and not God aligning our himself to our will. So that was the prayer of Joshua. We see the prolonging of the day in verse 13. It says the sun stood still and the moon stayed. Until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. God had a purpose. God wanted the Amorites driven out. He, he, he wanted them defeated. He wanted Israel to go in and take the land. They, had, they, they, they were at war. And God prolonged the day. Now we will see before we read, read the, the passage we read in verse 11 uh, that God had already been taking care of business. He, uh, uh, you know, this great victory. He had hailstones dropping upon their armies. It wasn't a great military victory where, where uh, Joshua outstrategized them. It wasn't uh, superior forces or superior fighting skills or anything else. God had his hand upon the battle. God has his hand upon your battle today. It doesn't matter what you're battling with. God has his hand there. And God will work things out for his purposes and for the good of those that love him. He prolonged the day that he might prolong the victory. 
Israel that day had complete victory. When God answers a prayer, he gives complete victory. When, when, when God does something, he doesn't partially do it. Have you ever heard this? You just do your part and God will do his. Or even the Lord helps those who help themselves. Now that's not saying we're supposed to be inactive. But God gets all the glory. Israel got no glory. Joshua gets no glory from the victory here. And God didn't partially. He didn't say, I'm going to wipe out so many of them. And it's up to you to take care of the rest. The victory was complete. He prolonged the day to prolong the defeat of the Amorites. Their defeat was complete. See, the Lord fought a battle for us on Calvary. He didn't say, I'm going to do what I can. And it's up to you to do the rest. I'm going to die upon the cross. And it's up to you to find me, to trust me, to believe me. I'm going to die upon the cross. And it's up to you to perform so many uh, uh, good deeds to let your, your good outweigh your bad. I'm going to die upon the cross and it's up to you to repent. Christ died upon the cross and he said, it is finished. It is finished. Christ didn't halfway save me. You know what the, the writer of Hebrews said? He said, he saved me to the uttermost. He saved me completely. That means he saved me for good. He saved me for good. I cannot be lost because every single one of my sins has been atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's now look at the power of the day. As I said, there are many critics, and, and this is one of the, you know, that they, 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 they uh, try to uh, undermine the story of, uh, of Jonah and the great fish. This is one of the stories that the, the, the critics and the skeptics will try to take and, and destroy. And they'll look for things flaws in this story. And they will say that it shows how ignorant Joshua was in writing this because the sun does not move around the earth. This earth moves around the sun and the sun the moon, the sun or I'm sorry the earth rotates and that's why we have day and night we have seasons because we go around the sun and we have day and night because the work the, the earth revolves so this passage is incorrect because it says the sun stood still Now, in poems and literature and, and, and singing, we talk about the sun moving across the sky. We know the sun doesn't literally move across the sky, but by appearance, it does. So it wouldn't be incorrect for him to say the sun stood still. He could be speaking in a way that people would understood. He could speak, be speaking poetically. He could be speaking of the appearance. Or, this may blow your mind. The Bible says the sun stood still. The sun stood still.
Now understand this, and, and we were talking about the power of the day. Now as you know, I'm not the brightest guy in the world. But, I heard that amen. Um, you amen me with your eyes, I understand. Uh, I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but we know how the universe works a little now, don't we? We, we, we've uh, had men in space, we have uh, 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 telescopes and, and that can see well into space. We know that we revolve around the sun. We know the moon revolves around the earth. We also know, and this is another thing that, that, that the, uh, uh, the people who don't believe in the biblical creation understand when they think of the Big Bang, Every single star, every single planet, every single body out there has to be exactly the way it is or everything would collide, just like the gears of a clock. In order for this to happen, not only would the earth stand still? The sun would have to stand still. Every planet in the solar system would have to stand still. Every moon would have to stand still. Every uh, planet in the universe would have to stand still. What a mighty God we serve. Rather than just saying, oh, well, he must have made the earth stand. No, he made everything stand still. Am I the only one that that doesn't blow your mind? And then let's look, let us look at the proof of the day. He says there in verse 13, Is it not written, He said the sun stood still, the moon, the moon stayed, the people would avenge themselves and their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? Turn really quickly to the book of Jasher if you would. What's the point I'm trying to make? The book of Jasher is not in our Bible. It is not scripture. It is a historical account. In other words, history shows that the sun and the moon stood still that day. The book of Jasher is mentioned, I believe, twice in the Bible. It is using that as a historical account. Now, you and I that believe the Bible, we need nothing more than the book of Joshua to tell us that the sun and the moon stood still. But there are people out there that will argue with you and understand that the Bible is not the only place where it talks about the sun standing still. Jasher also gives an account of the sun standing still. Not only that, historical proof, the Chinese... In their ancient writings, they talk about a day that was twice as long as the other days. The Aztecs also have the same account. The Incas have the same account. So the Babylonians and the Persians worldwide have this account of this long day. But only, only the people of Israel understood what was going on. You know, the, the, the ones in South America, they're on the other side of the world. And they are experiencing this long day. If you don't believe the historical proof, you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe the historical proof, there is also astrological proof. The astronomers that go and they look on these telescopes and they see how the, the heavenly bodies are aligned. In their calculations, they're much smarter than I am. They have gone back. And there is a day missing in time. So this is where everything should be, but there's a day missing here. Like I said, I don't know how they do it. I'm just reading the reports. I'm reading the results. They figured out that for some reason... Time is askew. 
And it goes back to the days of Joshua. And finally, I want to look at the protagonist of the day. Verse 14. It says, For the Lord fought for Israel. This is not a story of Joshua and his great power. This is a battle that the Lord fought and the Lord won. He hearkened to Joshua's prayer, but it was the Lord who won the battle. It was the Lord who fought. The, 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 the same Lord that, that did this that seems so incredible to us is the Lord that fights for you. That, that, that even nature itself seems to, 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 to say it's impossible. This is the same Lord, the eternal God that fights for you. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. The Lord fights for you. He won the battle on the cross. Matter of fact, he, he, he won the battle even before the cross because he remained sinless. But he won the battle upon the cross and he died for our sins. He won the battle in the coldness of the tomb. Because not only did he defeat our sins and destroy them, he defeated death. Death is the last enemy. But it was made subject under his feet. He won the battle to claim you. Satan fought very, very hard that you would not belong to Jesus. But he, by his spirit, called you, quickened you, brought you from death unto life. He wins the battle to keep you. The only reason that I am saved today, if I could lose my salvation, I would have lost it. Many, many times over. But the scripture said he is able to keep me from falling. And he'll win the battle to crown you. We talked in Sunday school about how, how Jesus was, will be recognized as king of kings. At his coronation. We too have crowns ahead of us. He has made us a royal priesthood. And not only will he deliver us to heaven. Those of us that know him as Lord and Savior. But he will place us on thrones and in principalities. And put us in positions far beyond what we ever deserve. What a great God we have. The, the, the God that is able to stop the sun. The God that is able to stop the moon. The God that is able to win the battle is the same God that came to this planet and died for our sins. Would you not trust a God like that today? Why don't you all stand? Sister Connie, if you would come.